Packet detection and synchronization, a very important topic in OFDM. Cross-correlation and autocorrelation uh, are going to be covered in this section. We will discuss where cross-correlation can be used, especially in course timing and also fine timing. And autocorrelation, in particular for 802.11a, is used in packet detection and also course frequency offset estimation. Here we show the preamble for the 802.11a packet. The first 10 symbols are the short symbol, each 16 samples long or 800 nanoseconds at 20 megahertz sampling rate. And the first few symbols are actually used during the packet detection, initial packet detection and AGC, and are consumed during the AGC process as we do automatic gain control. Once the automatic gain control has converged, we freeze the automatic gain control and lock it, so we can't use a T1 and T2 for packet detection. However, from T3 through T10, we can use the short symbols for both packet detection to determine whether the received packet is in fact an OFDM packet, and also to achieve coarse timing or fine timing. That is, we need to do timing synchronization in order to determine the boundaries. For example, we will have to identify the two long sequences, T1 and T2, in order to do fine carry offset estimation and correction and also channel equalization. It is important to achieve enough timing synchronization so that the timing boundary is well within the guard interval of the long training symbols so that during the coarse timing or fine timing we need to be within this guard interval so that we pick out the long symbols at least such that they are within the cyclic prefix. Uh, due to the cyclic property of the FFT and the fact that if if we have coarse timing and it falls within this window the effect is like a timing offset which in the frequency domain is just a phase shift and can be actually corrected through the channel equalization process. So it is not absolutely necessary to achieve perfect timing on this boundary shown over here between the guard interval and the long symbol. It is sufficient to be at least within the guard interval so that when we select this area here it's within because of the cyclic nature of the FFT we can still uh, equalize out this timing offset and achieve our goals. Now if the timing offset is, has too much error in multi-path fading channels, we have a lot of inter-symbol interference from the short into the guard interval here, but we have to be a little bit more accurate, especially for large RMS delay spreads. Timing synchronization can be obtained through processing of the short training symbols and also uh, using the long training symbols. Uh, we will focus on using the short training symbols for timing synchronization. In packet detection, both the short training symbols are used in an autocorrelation mode and also in a cross-correlation mode, and we will compare the two approaches as to which one is more appropriate for packet detection and also timing synchronization. An important paper is a paper by the folks at uh, IMEC again, a performance and complexity comparison of autocorrelation and cross-correlation in OFDM burst synchronization. And uh, here we just show a quote out of this article in which they use cross-correlation in order to do timing synchronization. And they point out that during cross-correlation, the actual result of a cross-correlation of the short symbols with the known short symbol at the receiver is that we reproduce the impulse response of the channel and that has a dramatic effect on the actual result of the cross-correlation. And in cross-correlation, if you want to do timing synchronization, you have to take this into consideration. And as they say, their proposal selects the earliest peak of a magnitude greater than some percentage of the largest peak. And this improvement tends to select the first multipath component rather than later reflections, thus reducing the variance of timing estimate. As we pointed out, it is very important that in the timing estimate we are at least within this guard interval here, and the further in the, to this region the better, and it's important to realize that sometimes the peak during a cross-correlation does not pick the right timing 
the earlier peak can be less than the later peak because of the dispersion in the multipath fading channel and we will investigate that thoroughly. We are interested in first analyzing cross correlation. In cross correlation the known complex short training sequence is cross correlated with the incoming packet and as we know as the cross correlation overlaps the short training symbol we do get a peak in the magnitude. However due to the effects of the channel but due to the multipath fading channel and the dispersion of the channel the peak is not very sharp and as we will show actually the result of the cross correlation is very similar to the impulse response of the channel and the peaks could degrade considerably and, it, and therefore just a simple thresholding over the peak may not be enough as is pointed out by the uh, article here and that's that's an approach that we will discuss. Before we proceed a quick review of convolution is in order and then we'll also derive relationships for cross correlation. Here we have a signal x of t and a, another signal y of t and we are interested in z of t which is the convolution of y of t and x of t and convolution is expressed through this integral relationship with the variable lambda and as we integrate over lambda uh, we have the function z of t and if we take a closer look at this integral relationship, if we set t equal to 0, then we get uh, y lambda times x of minus lambda. So what we're doing is actually multiplying the function y of t times x of minus t and integrating over t, except in this case we're using lambda. So take a look at x of t, and let's see what x of minus t is here, because we're going to need x of minus lambda. And x of minus t is just a mirror image of x of t. So by, by mirror images, for example, you take this point here and its mirror image would be on this side as shown over here. For example, this point, would, the mirror image would be here. And we get this curve, which is the mirror image of x of t. Now, if we plot y sub lambda as a function of lambda and also x of t minus lambda as a function of lambda, then at t equals 0, of course, we get x of minus lambda. And for various values of t, then we move the function around in time as a time offset. So z of t is basically obtained by fixing t. And then we get the function x of t minus lambda. We multiply it times y of lambda and integrate over lambda. And the value would be z of t. And t ranges from minus infinity to infinity. So we get a function of time, and this is the definition of convolution. An important property of the Fourier transform is that the Fourier transform of the convolution of two signals is the multiplication of their Fourier transforms. So the Fourier transform of z of t is equal to z sub f, and it is equal to the Fourier transform of y of t, y sub f, times the Fourier transform of x of t, or x of f. This is a very important relationship. So convolution in the time domain is multiplication in the frequency domain. And this is a very important Fourier transform property that we were interested in. Now, if we look at cross correlation, in cross correlation, we have a signal y of t and another signal x of t. And we want to form the cross correlation between x of t and y of t. Typically, we'd have y of t as follows, and then x of t in a cross correlation is a signal itself but shifted in time and we're interested in the how these two signals correlate so we would then multiply the two signals and integrate and we would get the signal w of t so in cross correlation unlike convolution uh, we don't have the mirror image of x of t but the signal itself here we have the relationship for convolution and recall that in convolution we form the mirror image of x of t so if we don't want to have the mirror image of x of t but x of t itself then we have to actually in the equation for convolution replace t with minus t and this will give us the original signal back and also the consequent relationship in the integral now, it turns out that a property of the Fourier transforms is, is that if you have x of t, then the Fourier transform of x of minus t is x conjugate of f. 
so that it is a conjugate of the Fourier transform, or X conjugate of F. Now since convolution in the time domain is multiplication of frequency domain, we still have for cross-correlation a convolution relationship, except that we have X of minus D. So we have that WF would be equal to Y sub F times X conjugate of F. This is the key relationship that we are interested in, in performing the cross-correlation. Let's take a look at an example of a cross-correlation. Here we have a pulse that has been corrupted by noise and we are going to do a cross-correlation with the original pulse and we see that again the pulse is shifted in time and as we move and integrate we obtain the function W of t. As the pulse moves under the received pulse we start to increase the cross-correlation and we have a peak when the pulse falls right underneath the received pulse with additive noise and then as the pulse moves away then of course the cross-correlation decreases. And this is actually uh, a match filter example. But the relationship we're very interested in is that if you have a cross-correlation in the time domain that in the frequency domain you have multiplication times the conjugate of the signal you're doing the cross-correlation for. Given that background, let us examine the effect of cross-correlation when we have the training symbols actually going through a channel being corrupted by noise and then we perform the cross-correlation at the receiver with the stored known training sequence. And at this point let's ignore noise for the moment. So if S of T is input to the channel and the channel has frequency response H of F and impulse response H of T, then Y of T is equal to the convolution of H of T and S of T, or in the frequency domain Y sub F is equal to H of F times S of F, and we get Y of F. Now, we're ignoring noise for the moment. As we pointed out, cross-correlation it can be thought of as convolution but with the mirror image of S of T. So here at the receiver we have the cross correlation with S of T, the training symbols. So we have Y of T, we have a cross correlation with of Y of T and S of T, and we get R of T. And if we take it to the frequency domain we get that R sub F equals Y sub F times the conjugate of S of F. Again we're doing the cross correlation. Y sub F itself is equal to S of F times H of F, the channel frequency response over here. Now, it turns out that R sub F then becomes equal to the magnitude squared of S of F times H of F, where H of F again is the frequency response of the channel. As we will show for the training sequence, the magnitude squared is equal to 1. So R sub F actually equals to H of F, which implies that R sub t equals H of t, or the result of the cross-correlation equals the impulse response of the channel. Now here we're showing the results for a uh, real signal, but these results can be also extended to the case of OFDM where we're dealing with complex cross-correlation. Here is the operation of cross-correlation using discrete time. R sub n is the received signal and T sub m is the training symbol, which is a complex short training symbol. We take its conjugate and form the sum from m equals 0 to n minus 1, where n is equal to 16 in, in, in the case of 802.11a using 20 megahertz sampling rate. So, the, so R sub n is then the cross correlation of the received signal with the training sequence and the conjugate is necessary because we're dealing with complex operations. Here we have taken the forward FFT of the short symbol. So we take the short symbol, the complex samples of the short symbol in 802.11a, the 16 samples, and we perform a forward FFT and compute its magnitude. And as you can see, the magnitude is constant. Going back to our derivation, we, we see that S of F in this case would be a constant and R sub t would equal to H of t in this case. Here we have a channel with a 2 nanosecond delay spread, which is very small, 
and we're doing a cross correlation of the received preamble and the OFDM symbols with the short training sequence and this is what we obtain we see that in this region here we're operating on the preamble and we get peaks due to the cross correlation here we're also plotting magnitude the initial transient here is due to AGC of course we ignore that here we have zoomed in to the first 3.2 microseconds and we observe that the cross correlation with the known training sequence produces a nice peak which can be used for course timing synchronization and can also be used for packet detection for example if we set a threshold here then if we go to the previous view graph if we set a threshold then we exceed that threshold only when we get a OFDM packet now later on we'll show that having a fixed threshold with cross correlation when you have multipath fading channels is not a not a bright idea now here we have a fading channel with 50 nanosecond delay spread and you'll notice that we still get high peaks due to cross correlation but the peaks are not as sharp and there is spreading of the peak if you go back to the previous case where we have hardly any delay spread at all we see that the cross correlation produces an impulse a sharp impulse just like an impulse response as we would expect for a channel that has that is completely flat however when you have 50 nanosecond delay spread the channel impulse response is actually dispersive and spreads out and that's what we see here where the peak decreases and we have actually a spreading out of the peak and multiple peaks now for the case of 150 nanoseconds you'll notice that the peak is also reduced and we have even more dispersion and some of the peaks are actually almost uh, the same height as the first peak this is a very interesting diagram that puts all three cases together we see that for the case of a 5 nanosecond delay spread we almost have an impulse response for the cross correlation for 50 nanoseconds we do get some dispersion and you see multiple peaks this is reflective of what's going on in the channel where you have multipath and for the case of 150 nanosecond RMS delay spread we see that the actual cross correlation begins to look like the impulse response of the channel and you have much more dispersion with multiple peaks reflecting more multipath contributions consequently we see that if we have a fixed threshold and later we'll show even if you have an adaptive threshold for packet detection cross correlation is not very appropriate because of the fact that the fading channel causes the peak to actually decrease and then you, you also have the case because of the multipath at large delay spreads you can have actually multiple peaks now since the fixed threshold does not work and you may have multiple peaks you'll have ambiguity even when you do thresholding you'll have ambiguity you will still have timing ambiguity because as the delay spread increases a peak detection may pick out a peak which is not exactly the correct peak for timing synchronization for example for 200 nanoseconds you can actually have the other peaks exceed the first peak that is why in the paper the approach is to actually select a peak and then begin a search prior to that peak for another peak a certain amount or threshold below the maximum peak in order to obtain the correct timing synchronization and this all goes back to the fact that the cross correlation is actually very similar to the impulse response of the channel we will turn our attention now to autocorrelation and compare it to cross-correlation and packet detection. In autocorrelation, we take the short symbols and perform an autocorrelation between the short symbols. So imagine that we're correlating this symbol with this symbol, and as we correlate them, we will get a peak when they overlap, and this peak will continue as shown in the actual simulation over here until we go past the 
last short symbol and we go into the guard interval of the long training symbols and we'll see a drop off from the peak and of course the initial short training symbols are consumed for AGC so we have a nice peak here and that is due to the fact that the short symbols are exact copies of each other and there's a high correlation among the symbols now a nice property to be expected from autocorrelation is that the channel affects the short symbols, the adjacent short symbols, exactly the same. Or not exactly the same, but similarly. That is to say that this symbol here goes through the channel and ex experiences a, a dispersion because of the channel. The next symbol goes through the same channel. We're assuming, of course, that the channel is not changing and that is the right assumption during the initial acquisition then this symbol will also go through the same dispersion and both will be highly correlated so this is a property of the autocorrelation method in the sense that even if you have multipath fading channels the short symbols are still highly correlated now below we show cross correlation where we have a copy of the short symbol at the receiver uncorrupted by the channel and we perform a cross correlation as we receive the packet. As we perform the cross correlation we will get and we're, here we're looking at the magnitude of the result of the cross correlation we will get peaks when the known short symbol overlaps the received short symbols and of course we can use these for coarse timing or even fine timing synchronization. Now the problem here is that as these short symbols go through the channel they are dispersed by the channel and become decorrelated with the known training symbol at the receiver especially when you have large RMS delay spreads and that's what we showed before so as you go through multipath channel they become decorrelated and the peaks actually decrease. Now what we want to investigate is whether that happens with the case for autocorrelation as we predict it shouldn't or shouldn't be as severe as the case with cross-correlation. Now here we're just looking at cross-correlation and autocorrelation compared in terms of packet detection even if autocorrelation turns out to be a better choice for packet detection especially immunity to other types of noise or other types of packets it will be a good discriminator for OFDM type packets with this particular preamble structure cross correlation is still very important in terms of more precise timing synchronization this plot is a scatter plot of the preamble RMS that is we're measuring the RMS value of the preamble versus the peak of the cross correlation so we're we are actually t looking looking at the peak of the cross correlation plotting it against the RMS value of the preamble during the short preamble we see that at, even at 5 nanoseconds delay spread that there is a peak with a high likelihood to be around say 0.15 between the 0.14 and 1.15 and at a uh, particular value for the preamble RMS so there's a correlation between the preamble RMS and also the most of the peak values are above a certain threshold so if you assume they fix a threshold uh, this will show that you are able to actually do quite a good job in packet detection because most of the channel realizations would fall above that threshold but you do have cases where you fail to detect valid packets as shown over here so one question is whether an adaptive threshold attracts the signal power or the preamble RMS will improve performance well here we show that if you have 50 nanosecond delay spread in the channels each point in the scatter diagram here is a realization of a channel with 50 nanosecond RMS delay spread we see that there is hardly any correlation between the measured RMS 
of the preamble and the actual peak. So you can see that it is very difficult to set a fixed threshold and to use cross-correlation for packet detection. Again, if you want to use cross-correlation in order to do timing synchronization, you actually use peak searching algorithms. As we mentioned in the article, you may actually even look for a peak and then go back and search for an earlier peak. Here is the result for 150 nanosecond delay spread, and we see again that there is a very difficult to set a fixed threshold and to use cross-correlation for packet detection when the channel delay spread is very high. For autocorrelation here we show the block diagram as presented in the paper by IMEC. Autocorrelation is basically expressed through this expression here where we get the received signal R sub n and delay it by 16 samples, conjugate it, and sum it, and therefore we're, we are obtaining a autocorrelation of the short training symbols. So basically we're forming autocorrelations, we're basically over a 16 sample window correlating this signal with this part, and this part with this part for the remainder of the short training symbols, and of course we get a peak during that period. When we move into the long training sequence, of course there is no correlation and it drops off. Now one other thing that you should notice here is that we're actually taking the magnitude squared of the received signal and doing a moving average on that, which means that we're actually calculating the power of the signal and we normalize the result of the autocorrelation by the estimated input power and then we form the magnitude and find the maximum or the peak. Now this is an adaptive threshold so to speak in which we actually track the input power. It's equivalent to an adaptive threshold. One other thing we want to notice is that during autocorrelation is the autocorrelation process as shown here and obtaining the maximum or the peak this can be used in order to compute the coarse frequency offset and I refer you to the discussion on estimating the coarse carrier frequency offset or the fine carrier frequency offset in which we can actually perform an autocorrelation and find the arctangent and by the scaling factor shown here actually obtain the coarse frequency offset so that's a bonus of the autocorrelation method Here we show the results of an autocorrelation on a received OFDM packet. Initially we have uh, AGC and then we have the peaks during the autocorrelation where we have high correlation between the short symbols and it drops off as we run into the long training symbol. And this is for a delay spread of 50 nanosecond and we get a nice peak here, very unambiguous. Here we've zoomed into that area and we see the peaks and then the drop off as we move into the long training symbol. Notice that at this point we have 160 samples and over here we have 320 and this is the region for the long training symbols. This plot is very important. It is a scatter plot where each point in the scatter plot represents a channel realization and the channels all have 50 nanosecond RMS delay spread. We are plotting the preamble RMS against the value of the peak of the autocorrelation. So we're taking the RMS value of the preamble during this period here and plotting the peak of the autocorrelation against the RMS value of the preamble. Now what's important about this plot is that the scatter plots are all bunched together almost in a linear line with most channel realizations falling within a very tight region. Another very important point is that as we increase the preamble RMS of certain channels that have a larger 
preamble RMS, the peak of the autocorrelation tracks it very well. That is why we can use an adaptive threshold. Because if, if we normalize the peak of the autocorrelation with the short-term power, then they both track and we can have a fixed threshold and detect the packet reliably. The question remains, what happens when we have channels with larger and larger RMS delay spreads? Well, in this case, we have channels with a 150 nanosecond RMS delay spread. And again, we see that the peak tracks the preamble RMS, and we have a tight fit around a linear curve for almost all of the channel realizations with a few scattered about. So again, even with a 150 nanosecond delay spread, a adaptive threshold where we actually normalize by the received power, we can achieve reliable packet detection. So contrast occurs for the autocorrelation peak versus preamble RMS for the case of 150 nanosecond delay spread with the case of the peak of the cross correlation. You see that there is no correlation between the preamble RMS and the peak of the cross correlation. It's very difficult to set an adaptive threshold here. And our conclusion is that the autocorrelation technique on the short preambles is the more appropriate technique in order to do robust packet detection in OFDM. Now we have to qualify that. There's a lot of trade-offs when you have adjacent channel and jammers and how each one of those may affect the packet detection using autocorrelation and cross-correlation. But we'll leave that up for a different investigation. Here are some interesting results from a paper published in uh, IEEE 2003 called Robust Timing Synchronization for OFDM-Based Wireless LAN Systems by the authors shown here. And they have an interesting method in order to detect packets and also to achieve robust timing synchronization. Here, of course, they're not considering AGC. So on the x-axis, they have the received sample index. And on the y-axis, they have the magnitude of either the autocorrelation or the cross-correlation. In this case, the, there is no channel. The channel is flat and there is no noise. And you notice that we have a nice peak during the autocorrelation, as we've shown before. And during cross-correlation, you also have nice peaks. Now, in their computation of the cross-correlation, they are actually averaging. So that's why you see that the peaks actually start to fall off, because you're not averaging over as many short symbols as you are in this region of the preamble. The paper actually takes advantage of the fact that the peak at the autocorrelation starts to taper off, and you have peaks in the cross-correlation in order to achieve robust timing synchronization. This plot is very interesting. In this case, they have low SNR, 7 dB. They have a delay spread for the channel of 100 nanoseconds, RMS delay spread, and a frequency offset of 200 kilohertz. Clearly, the cross-correlation with the short symbols has reduced its peak. Its peak has been reduced, as we have shown also. Also, the peak is reduced when you have, also the peak is reduced when you have frequency offset because frequency offset also decorrelates the short symbol with the known as short symbol at the receiver. So the, so the short symbols go through a carrier offset distortion and they become decorrelated with your short symbol that you're using for cross-correlation. So the peak does decrease. However, again, using the fact that the autocorrelation starts to ramp down and you still have peaks that you can detect, uh, the paper points out that you can still obtain robust timing synchronization. Going back to the uh, short preamble used in 802.11a in OFDM, as you can see, the process of packet detection, timing synchronization, and uh, we've discussed uh, the issue of coarse carrier offset estimation and correction and fine carrier offset estimation and correction, all use either the 
short training symbols or the long training symbols and the short symbols are absolutely necessary in both AGC and packet detection and course timing. The long symbols can also be used since they are exact copies of each other and the guard interval are basically it's a cyclic prefix so it is up to the implementer to decide which particular algorithm to use in order to obtain robust packet detection and timing synchronization and there's a lot of space for innovation in this area and many different vendors probably use different techniques in order to do packet detection and timing synchronization we've just pointed out uh, a few techniques based on the published literature.